How have you been enjoying First and Second Kings? You know, I, I think it's good to go to things that we're not as familiar with. It opens up some new thinking streams and ideas, and, and it also helps us put together sort of the underpinning, the foundation of why certain uh, things are important about Jesus. You know, we find out in this whole book that the, the one so conclusion you can have is no one turns out to be anywhere close to the king that Jesus Christ will be. Some do better than others, but not many. We saw last week only a handful do pretty well in the Lord's sight. Most do what? Evil in the Lord's sight. That's what most of them do. I'm not going to say all leaders are like that, but as we've said, leadership, especially um, leadership without accountability, can lead to all sorts of sin, right? And so that happens in our day. It's happened in history. The only one without sin who became our leader, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is Jesus. He is the king that everybody was looking for in First and Second Kings and never found. But we know him. He's our king now. He's our king. Because the kings are not up to God's expectations and don't truly serve the people, God provides a counterbalance to the kings. The prophets. The prophets. Now, it's generally thought the prophets tell the future. And certainly prophets do talk about the future. Um, we're reading Revelation, right, Jerry, in our men's Bible study, and certainly John projects out as to what God's going to do to bring everything to completion. But, but mainly what the prophets are doing is not just providing a bunch of predictions. They're drawing lines. They're saying, if you keep doing this, this, and this, and any of you know geometry, if you do this, this, and this, I can draw a line through it. I know where you're going to end up. So stop doing this, this, and this, and start doing this, and this, and this. So you can end up in the right direction. The prophets say, if you keep going this rate, this is where you're going to end up. But, but don't keep going this rate. We can switch. We can do good in the sight of the Lord. We're capable of that, with God's help, of course. We're capable of correcting ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit if we ask God to guide us. Unfortunately, we see again today a king who does evil, but we're given the blessing of a prophet to counterbalance that king. And I want to look at a couple of them that were, uh, that were preceding us here. I may, be, I may have to depend on you there, Eric. Um, the prophets versus the kings. You may remember that the very first king that God gave his people was Saul. Saul. Saul was anointed by Samuel, but Samuel wasn't thrilled about this. And Samuel kept close tabs on Saul. In fact, Samuel's the one that sought out David, little David, the youngest runt of the family, and anointed him king by the word of the Lord before Saul even knew he had a successor. So Samuel was the corrective, the counterbalance to Saul's evil leadership brought David into play. However, David didn't turn out to be perfect either, did he? His affair with Bathsheba, his dealing with Bathsheba's husband, and other things that as well show that he might have been a man of God and after God's own heart, but he was also a sinner. He confesses as much in the Psalms that he writes. Nathan is the one that, that makes it clear to David what kind of sinner he is. The prophet tries to keep the king in line. They're not always successful, but the great thing for us is their words are recorded so that we can keep learning from them. What do the prophets say about leadership? What do the prophets say about following the ways of the Lord? We're gifted with that. Ahab comes along and we'll get to Elijah. You may know that name Jezebel. Right? She's, she's uh, often ascribed as being a, a very um, femme fatale. But her main issue was not her sexuality. It was her faith 
in the gods of her people, the pagan gods. Elisha will come along as a successor to Elijah, and he will be a part of the justice meted out to Jezebel. Admittedly, pretty horrific. You can read it for yourself. And then in the New Testament, just to make sure we make the step, the leap over that chasm, what is John but a prophet up against Herod for the un- lawful relationship he has with his wife and what does it cost john indeed what is the price prophets always play jesus says that prophets are not welcome in their own home the level to which jesus was a prophet there's no denying islam calls jesus a prophet jesus of course combined more than just prophecy He became a priest, the king of everything. But this is the dynamic we have. The the king oversteps and the prophet cries out. Sometimes the king listens, as when Nathan confronts David, sometimes the king does not. We must be careful as we listen to prophets even in our day. I know some have come to the conclusion that when people say prophetic things, they say, they say, maybe this isn't the right thing to do as a leader. Maybe this is something that needs to be reconsidered or, or maybe a decision by our government or by our leadership or even by our church or our business. Maybe it's wrong to criticize. We should be careful because this is exactly what the prophets did. They criticized, um, not just to run things down but to try to realign with what's good and true. Inasmuch as prophets do that, they have to pay the price. Prophets are not usually popular. They're usually very deeply unpopular. Anybody who wants to be a prophet better be prepared for such a life. But it's a life of faith, hopefully lived out faithfully. Sometimes it is good to question leadership, government, pastors do that less though that's ahab did evil we see this in first kings chapter 16 if you feel like following along i'm going to read a couple of the verses from there it's on page 322 some of you like to do that first kings uh actually 323 Ahab becomes king of Israel, in verse 29, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. He reigned in Samaria. Remember, now, this is the Israel tribes. They've got their new headquarters, not in Jerusalem. That's Judah. They're up north in Samaria. Uh, And you know the name of the Samaria becomes a bad name, right, later on, right? So you can see where that comes from. He reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any of those before him. So at least he has that going for him. Might as well be the best, right? He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. Wow, outstanding leadership for the enemy. Ahab does evil. On uh, the left, we see an archaeological artifact of a statue of Baal. You might be able to get a little an idea where we got our images of Satan from by looking at that. In fact, a a lot of the um, ideas of Satan come from the uh, understanding of Baal and Baal's role. Ahab did evil also by marrying Jezebel because remember that God wanted God's people to marry God's people, to keep the tribe together, to to keep the faith together. These were the chosen people and, and marrying outside of that group 
inevitably brought in not just um, you know, new, uh, new people, but new ideas or different ideas, the kind of ideas God was trying to deliver them from. And so Jezebel, she was true to her faith, but it was antithetical to the faith that Ahab had been anointed to promote. And therefore, she becomes a symbol of how Ahab does evil. However, uh, Elijah responds. Elijah, in chapter 17, speaks on behalf of the Lord. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Except at my word. So, next slide. Elijah uh, predicts on behalf of God uh, a consequence of this uh, straying from the one path of a famine, of a desert time. Elijah can't bring this about on his own. The prophets never position themselves as the one that's going to bring about the consequence. You can even see that in Jesus himself. That idea is, is that this is God's judgment. I'm just telling you what's going to come to pass. I'm just telling you that this direction you're headed in is going to lead to this. This strain, abandoning your faith, is going to bring a dryness. I think we can all understand that. <laughs> that it, at times in our life when we have distanced ourselves from the faith that we have, that it's not so much that God punishes, but that he lets us do it. He lets us experience what it's like to be away from him. He lets us experience the dry time because, after all, he gives us free choice. He's not going to make you believe in him. He wants you to. And when we stray from our own faith and the commitment we have to it, we may experience indeed dry times. He is always ready to refresh us, though. All we have to do is return to the Lord. All we have to do is cry out in our honest confession like we did to begin our service. God, help me. I've strayed. Obviously, look at the situation that I found myself. But Ahab doesn't repent. Ahab doesn't care. Ahab holds this entirely against Elijah. And that's why in chapter 18, when he meets up with Elijah, he says, um, is that you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah says, I have not made trouble for Israel. You and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the pagan gods, the Baals. You are responsible for this. I don't want to say it, but I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. When God becomes less significant in our life, I can tell you that the blessings of God will always be available and his love will be unconditional, even in that time. But you will experience the consequences. You will experience them. When our prayer life goes, when we stop reading scripture, when worship attendance lags or, or, or dissipates, you're going to experience the spiritual dryness. The good news is that God isn't holding this against you. If anything, he's um, allowing you to experience that, just like we might carefully allow children to experience consequences for their actions. We have to be very careful as parents to do that, right? We don't let a little kid cross the road and, well, if he got hit, then he learned his lesson, you know. But we do um, oftentimes let kids make some decisions and, and, and let them experience what is the consequence of that decision. They do learn that way, right? Unfortunately, it gets harder as they become teenagers and they make more drastic decisions, but, but a good parent still uh, has to let kids make some decisions on their own. A helicopter parent 
is going to find a rude awakening when the helicopter can no longer get all the way to Tallahassee or Gainesville. I think I'm going to see parents now with that rocket thing that guy has. You see the rocket thing in France? I see parents over, over at the school just sort of... It won't go that far. He couldn't cross the channel. You can't get all... When they go away, they're going to make their decisions. We have to help them learn their lessons before they go as best we can, as much as we can stand it. Oh, it's so hard. But God feels the same way. God hates seeing us suffer at the consequences of our own mistakes, so much so that God does, I think, intervene. God, I think, um, doesn't abandon us to those worst situations. Even at the bottom, he is still finding ways through friends and family and faith to try to reach us. But he gives us the dignity to make our own mind up. Again, I say his love never falters. Those who, who believe in him have no fear of salvation, but, but to experience a life that is so empty of the blessings of the Lord. What would be the point? Elijah wants to show everybody how pointless the worship of Baal is. And, and this was one of my favorite stories growing up, and you all probably remember it, where he, he challenges them to a contest. Bring all your prophets, and I'm going to take them on. Two altars. Put our cows on either side here. You get them to bring fire down on this a bow. They cut themselves. They dance around. They do all sorts of things. Not a single thing happens. He says, throw water on mine. <laughs> and down comes the fire. And for some reason, I remember as a kid that all the prophets of Baal got burned up too, but I don't know if I found that in here. I think as a kid that might have been an addition that I liked. But um, that would be a very Game of Thrones kind of uh, ending of things um, that everybody dies. But uh, that's not the point. The point is God's victorious. God proves. And therefore God judges the, the way people have been led and the way people have strayed. Uh, with love, but with firmness. And so as, as I was thinking about what would, what would God contest today? It, it, what would a prophet, you know, here today, standing approximately here in this area, what would a prophet like cry out against and bring some fire down on today? And at first I started thinking, well, it's, it, it might be some things that other churches believe. And I thought, there's a lot to talk about. But when I really get down to it, not that much important. I mean, after all, we're kind of all on the same side. Yes, I have a lot of problem with the prosperity gospel preaching, which is, is, is the largest preaching now that's growing all over. I've got a friend who's from uh, um, uh, Brazil. It's blowing up in Brazil. Everybody wants to come to church on Sunday and hear, if you give money to church today, you're going to get even more when you get home. I love that stewardship program. It is not biblical. It is biblical that God will give you what God wants to give you, not what you bribe him into giving you. We get because we are grateful not to get something in return. So prosperity, God, I could talk about some of those. I could talk about the Missouri Synod for a little while, but, you know, I don't want to offend some of you. Uh, I could talk about Catholics for a while, but, you know, actually I'm kind of a closet Catholic in some ways, so I'm not going to say anything negative. I'm not going to say anything about the Methodists. Don't worry. I think, I, I, I got Shane here. I'm not, he's like three different things. And, and isn't he great? We're just so happy to have him on, on our ministry. You should have seen how the Lord was moving him and, and Jessica and Vacation Bible School. And listen, I was talking to a pastor from the Apostolic Lutheran Church up north um, in Lantana, and I said, the one thing I'm going to believe right now, I'm going to trust and believe, is we're all part of the body of Christ. All right? We can talk, right? We can talk. We can work together. We can serve together. Let's not get into that fight but there are some things that I feel a little feisty about. 
that I think is worth talking about that actually will get me in more trouble, most likely. Because they're things that we really experience, that I really experience, that you experience. The first, um, if we're going to talk about what kind of idolatry Ahab was sharing, what kind of idolatry is around us today? What gods are we worshiping? How are we aligning our ultimate faith? The first I'd like to talk about is the idolatry of sports and entertainment. Can I get an amen? Maybe not many of you. I I tell you, um, I am more nervous about talking about sports and entertainment than the other two. Why? Because sports means so much to us. How many... Christian shirts do you own? How many Roll Tide shirts or Pick Your Favorite Team shirts do you own? How many people you know that don't even make Christmas and Easter but have season tickets to the Dolphins and never miss a game? How many people can't tell you the difference between Elijah and Elisha but can tell you all about the recent Hall of Fame selections for baseball? Who cares? You do. I can pick on sports because I don't care. I don't care. Sports doesn't interest me at all. I just never had any time for it. No interest. I know, I know when I start the game someone's going to win and lose. I know for a fact the team I'm cheering for is going to lose. That, that comes from living in Chicago and being a Cubs fan. But I'm an entertainment person. I love music, secular music, and art, and all sorts of things that don't have crosses all over them. I love that. And, and there are so many times that I realize all day long my Pandora station has been on a Celtic New Age instead of maybe a Christian station instead. How much of our time do we devote? How much of our energy, our money, and our finances do we devote to sports and entertainment? And what's worse, what are we teaching our kids? Routinely now, routinely, absolutely sacred now, travel teams practice on Sundays. Do you know that? It is now a given fact if you join a travel basketball, baseball, soccer, rugby, lacrosse, whatever it is, they are going to practice on Sundays because on Saturday the other programs practice. Do you know there is absolutely no way on a travel team to say to your coach, I have to go to church. You will not stay on the team. Your grandkids might be busy right now, at this very moment, on some field somewhere. And when you say to your kids, have you guys gotten a chance to go to church, what do they say? Oh, we're so busy. They are. Do you know how many hours kids spend on sports? Now, God loves to see human endeavor succeed and people strive for the best. God made us so that we could do that, right? We could never uh, do what we do if God hadn't. And he loves to hear a beautiful um, opera voice. He loves to hear, um, see paintings done by people who don't know him at all. He, all things are beautiful in, in, in God's sight. I'm not saying we dump sports and entertainment, but do we have any handle on it? any perspective on it, or are we losing it completely? There are people that will say, I hope the sermon's not going to go too long on Super Bowl Sunday. Do you know when the Super Bowl starts? It starts at 8 o'clock p.m. I can preach all day and you can still get home and get your little cheese whiz melted in the microwave oven. I've heard that, though. I have absolutely heard. And the church is scheduled in Wisconsin. They schedule their services to get done in time for Green Bay Packer games. I know that. Same in Chicago. Okay. 
We all offended now? If your kids, grandkids, you, are spending more money, energy, and time on sports than on God, please think about it. If your gift to your alumni association, go Gators, no, that's the wrong thing, um, is greater than your tithe, think about it. And maybe get rid of some of those shirts. Just kidding. There's the idolatry of human reason. This one probably won't bother anybody, but, but it, it, it's significant. Um, I say human reason because I don't want to use the word science, because I think science is another gift of God. It's not so much science that's the problem here. I know we're fighting against it. And Missouri Synod just uh, had a vote. Um, it, it was at a convention where they affirmed the 24, six days, 24-hour creation. 6,000-year-old earth plan. You can believe that. Um, we can get that from Scripture. We can get a lot of other views as well. But they, they feel like they needed to make that. Why? Because they feel very threatened by the impact of science on faith. They're worried that people um, will, be a, will be adversely affected um, in their faith if we start applying science to it. And it's funny, we've been dealing with this a long time in the church, and so far it really hasn't had that great of an effect. But, but truly human reason is something to be concerned about. I, this popped in my mind because, did you watch the theory of everything with Stephen Hawkins, anybody? Yeah, it was, it was a fascinating thing to see a guy with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, his body crumbling, but his brain engaged and lively, um, thinking about the ultimate um, mathematical equations of the universe. He, he was considered perhaps one of the greatest minds since uh, Einstein in this regard. But the, the weird thing is he married a good Catholic girl. And, and it was interesting to see them talk about faith because he had none at all. And, and this really caught me. He says, faith is for people who are afraid of the dark. I don't know how much more offended I could be. I respect those who feel that way. I mean, I love everyone despite my own personal feelings. <laughs> but how offensive. Faith is for people who are afraid of the dark. Like we're a bunch of children, like we don't have minds of our own, like the greatest minds in the world in the past and in the present haven't engaged fully in their intellect in faith matters. That some of the greatest scientists in the world are not in our seats today, maybe in this room. Faith is for those who are afraid of the dark. But this has worked its way into society incredibly. And we're not going to hold it back by motions about six days of creation alone. I mean, what we have to say is, um, do you think humans know it all? Because I'm pretty sure we don't. I think when you add it all up, we don't know anything. Or as the Game of Thrones might say, you know nothing, Jon Snow. We don't know anything. Push to the wall. I guess that would be kind of a bad sight to think of the wheelchair all that, but just pushed up in an intellectual argument. Stephen Hawking had to say, of course we don't know how it all started. But interestingly enough, and that's usually the argument we use, right? Someone was there before the Big Bang, right? That's kind of the argument. He is uh, thought of it mathematically that no one was there before the Big Bang. That the Big Bang is um, the way that physics puts together the universe. And he would argue that we've had Big Bangs before. And this has been going on because it just goes on. So even he can leave God out of the equation. His wife couldn't, though. It was one of the, the hardest things in their relationship, she wrote later, to think that her husband, who was a good man in many ways, had no room for God. And, and I think people today are finding this out. One of the distressing things to read is that the more higher education people get, the less likely they are to believe in God. 
It's not tremendous. And it's interesting, it's not as strong in Christians as it is in other religions in our country. So that's hopeful. But, but basically the idea is it appears that the more you learn about the world, the less room you have for that little Sunday school God or the vacation Bible school God as the case might be. And I think that might be true, but that's kind of a small version of God. I remember when I went to, to college, we had our first religion class. We had the guy that was, his goal was to blow our faith up completely in the first four weeks and for the next eight, ten weeks to reintroduce our faith to us now as adults. And it worked for me. I thought religion was sweet and kind and I loved the girls who were Christians. And they let me play my guitar and sing. But when he blew my faith up and then helped me put it back together again, nothing's been the same. He kind of is a bad man in a way. But he did what I needed to do, which was, hey, your faith can grow up. We need to help our kids as they uh, grow up in intellect and education to say, hey, before you leave all this silliness behind, let me tell you, there's a lot more to know about faith in God. The idolatry of human reason, the idea that we know everything is pervasive now. Everybody's entitled now to know everything. And everybody now is entitled to feel everything. Whatever they want to feel is right. Have you noticed this? We're all guilty of it now. If I feel this way, it must be right. At minimum, it's right for me, it, but it also might be right for everybody. Mostly, it's right for me, and I'm going to live that way. I feel good about it. The chief prophet of that, of course, would be Oprah, who's blessed many lives. I hate to criticize Oprah, except that I can't stand her approach to religion, which is basically take a little bit of what you like from all of them, put it together, and call that faith. Our personal feelings now, putting together what we like, little slogans. There's actually websites that help you build your own faith. Name your God. Pick your quotes, your texts, your rituals. This guy's ritual on Easter Sunday is to go to the art museum on Easter Sunday. Well, it's a ritual. Put together. This is not considered a problem, folks. This is considered a project now. This is not a problem. I can tell you why. I was at a conference a couple weeks ago, and most of the people at the conference that I was at, it was a pretty small group, were not Christian. In fact, when I said I was a Christian pastor, a bit of an intake of breath took place around the table. And these were all nonprofit executive directors, so they were all really good people doing good things. All sorts of good people, but not religious. One man said to me, I'm a boo Jew. I said, What's a boo Jew? He's a Buddhist Jew. There is no such thing. Another woman said, hey, I'm a boo-jew too. So their denomination now has two people. They're wonderful people making up their own religions. He likes this from Judaism. He likes this from Buddhism. Hey, I respect all of that. I learn from all of them. But, but I'm not a boo-jew. <laughs> and neither are you. We're Christian. You can't take something from every place on the buffet and call that a meal. That's just a mess, especially when you really, truly do believe Jesus is the one. Everything has to be reassessed in the light of knowing that. Everything has to be reexamined. I respected them, and what was fascinating to me is by the end of the weekend that I was with them, they could not stop talking about how nice it was to be with a Christian for the weekend. So there's hope. Let them know you're Christian at the right moment and be nice. Be thoughtful. Listen to their boo Jewishness. It's fascinating to me. 
Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I'm talking so long. All right, to end, the last, apologies, apologies. Good thing there's no Super Bowl today. The last thing, last slide, please. How long, I guess is the point, how long, Elijah says, will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal is God, follow him. This is the ultimate challenge, and it comes out in the first commandment, doesn't it? I noticed that there was a um, thing in North Dakota that they have set up a rule now, and they're doing it right now. They're painting, in God we trust, in every school. They've got like some, I saw one of the pictures of it. I said, we can fight that way, you know, try to reimpose Christendom on our country. Um, I admire that. It's not going to probably work. I think more likely what's going to work is for us to be even more firm in our faith. I think what's going to work for us is to, is to challenge ourselves as to where the idolatry has crept in and show the world what it means to be a Christian, to inspire them. I, I, I don't think I converted anybody that weekend, but it was really interesting to see what an effect someone who believes in the way the truth and the life can have uh, on others. And so I guess for that weekend, I was a kind of a quiet prophet, and that's what we all need to be. Uh, the world is going to go its own way, friends. We can moan it and groan it. We can fight it. But most of all, what we need to do is know what we stand for and to share it. Amen.